Psalm 147. One of the things I love about reading the Psalms, and of course, I, I dearly love the Psalms, but when we get a Psalm that I can actually look into and talk about some of the history behind it, I love that. I was a history major. I love putting things together and understanding why things are the way they are. And Psalm 147 gives us a few clues that establishes the era it was composed in. Uh, verse 2 says that Yahweh builds up Jerusalem. And the thir verse 13, that he strengthens the bars of the gates. The psalmist is referring to a Jerusalem that is currently standing and that God is responsible for the construction. Verse 2 also states that Yahweh gathers the outcasts of Israel. So the psalmist has in mind the return of Israel from somewhere outside of their land. And finally, the gathering of the Israelite outcasts that, that occurs in, in verse 13. It mentions God's blessing on the children within Jerusalem. Now, the only time in Israel history that all of these things and this regathering of the people takes place was after the exile that they endured. And to understand that, we need to understand a little bit of the history. Of course, if you go all the way back into Moses, and they, he leads the people out of slavery from Egypt. And then under Joshua, they conquer the promised land. And then we have, for a, a, about a 400-year period, we have the judges who are ruling over Israel at the time. And eventually, they, the people of Israel really want a king. And so God provides them with the united kingdom under Saul and David and Solomon. And of course, David has the, his great sin, and God comes to him and says, because of your sin, the kingdom is going to be taken. It's going to be divided out from you. But I won't do it during your reign, and I won't do it during your son's reign either. So after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam is now, is now made king. Rehoboam uh, does not do a good job. And in fact, at one point, uh, when he's confronted by this guy named Jeroboam, uh, Rehoboam has the chance to make things right and to make things, to keep things united. But instead, he listens to his younger advisors who are basically saying, yeah, you're the man, you tell him what to do, while his older advisors are saying, hey, let's try to work this out. So this is an encouragement to John, listen to me and not the teenagers. Uh, so, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but so that's what's going on. So the kingdom splits. And then we get the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom possesses 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom has Judah and Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin settled mostly around the area we know as Jerusalem. So that goes on, and at various points throughout that short history, uh, they're, they're either at war with one another or they're fighting with each other. They're fighting against other people. But in 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire comes in, and it conquers the northern tribe of Israel. Now here's where it gets interesting. We're going to talk about three empires very, very quickly, Assyria, Babylon, and the Persian Empire. And each of them had a different way of dealing with the captives. The Assyrians were known for their ruthless and harsh treatment of the captives. Basically, if they didn't kill you, they took you and they scattered you throughout the empire and in, not, and in very small clumps. So there wasn't a whole lot of, of the people of Israel going out to different places. And basically, they assimilate wherever they end up and they disappear into history. Those ten northern tribes are gone. So if you ever heard of the lost tribes of Israel, that's what it's referring to. Then, so that goes on from there. So in, five, in about 597 to 586, uh, the Babylonians come in and they conquer the southern kingdom of Judah. But the Babylonians have a different opinion about what to do with the captives. They leave a few behind, and in fact, that's what's going to eventually become the Samaritans that's going to cause all kinds of problems in the New Testament. Not problems, but we, we, we know they're not, they're not looked on favorably. But the Babylonians would take a huge chunk of their conquered people and bring them to Babylon and make them servants within the kingdom. This is where we get Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're serving within the Babylonian cap, uh, the capital there. The Babylonians basically allow folks to worship as long as it's in private. Uh, you couldn't do anything publicly uh, until, of course, we remember that story about Nebuchadnezzar creating his, his statue and the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will not bow down to it, and so therefore they're thrown into the fiery furnace. Uh, but basically, 
You can have your own religion, just don't be public about it. Persians were very different. The Persians cap cap capture Babylon in 539. And Cyrus the Great, uh, who, is the who is this great Persian emperor, uh, they had a very, very different opinion. They were very tolerant and respectful of local traditions. They allowed people to keep their religions, their languages, their laws. They also left local leaders in place to, and rebuilt local temples that had been destroyed by war. And so this treatment made conquered people feel like they were actually part of the Persian Empire instead of conquered people and help reduce rebellions. Now, the conquered people would be you know, expected to pay you know, Persian authority to, to recognize that, to pay taxes, and engage in military service. But they were part of the empire. And here's the interesting thing. Remember that part I said about they would actually pay to rebuild. So, hey, it's been destroyed, and maybe we, did, we destroyed it, but now we're going to rebuild it for you. That's where the whole thing that we just read in Ezra, that's what that was all about. Cyrus was saying to the conquered people of Judah, you can go back to your homeland. And here, out of our secular treasury, we're going to provide you all the funds to do it. Here's the really interesting thing historically. If you read the book of Isaiah, he predicts the, by name, predicts the coming of Cyrus 200 years before Cyrus would come on the scene. Now, of course, there are scholars today who's like, oh, no way that Isaiah 45 was written by Isaiah, and, you know, when he... But we believe wholeheartedly that God has the ability to get to write down 200 years beforehand and for him to follow through. So, with that, that sets the scene for where we are in Psalm 147. Let's read. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, he gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power, his understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble, he casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor in the pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. For he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob and the statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's go to him in a brief word of prayer, and we'll dig in. Gracious Heavenly Father, be with us as we study your word and open our hearts and minds to you and allow your Holy Spirit to work through us. Father, be with the one who speaks. He is a great sinner, but he has a great Savior. And now, Father, may the words of my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, amen. So what I really want to look at today is this exhortation to praise. And in Psalm 147, we're given three times that it says to praise God. Verse 1, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Verse 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. And then finally, verse 12, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, praise your God, O Zion. And so today we're going to be looking at why we praise God and how we praise God. 
And so when we look at why we praise God, Psalm 147 answers this question by telling us, first of all, who he is and then what he's done. And that's answered in verse 5. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Uh, those two are two of our, you know, when we describe God, we like to use these big words called the omnis. Uh, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Well, we're talking about two of them today. His omniscience, his all-knowing, his omnipotence, his all-powerfulness. Omni his omnipotence means that he possesses unlimited and supreme power and that God can do anything that is logically possible and consistent with his nature. I add that in there because I always had the teenager when I was a youth pastor and I would say, do you have any questions? And I'd have the one who'd go, yes, can God make a rock that is so big that not even he can lift it? And that's why I would add the not logically possible, not consistent with his nature, be quiet. Uh, <laughs> but then his omniscience, it's defined as the state of having total knowledge, the quality of knowing everything. For God to be sovereign over his creation of all things, whether visible or invisible, he has to be all-knowing of everything. That's why when we think, oh, you know what? There's no way he saw that sin. Yes, he did. We see his omniscience and his omnipotence and in, in, in his power over all of creation. He knows everything about his creation. I love verse 4 where he talks about he knows all the stars. He's named them. Astronomers estimate that there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone. And there are billions of galaxies in the universe. And yet our God, the creator of heaven and earth, not only knows the number of the stars, but has placed each one in the position that he so desired and called it by name. Charles Spurgeon wrote, he counts them like a merchant counts coins. And if God names the stars objects that despite their beauty are still inanimate and distant, how much more does he care for us, his image bearers? His children. Moses 10.30 tells us even the very hairs on our head are all numbered. God's attention to detail and care extends to every aspect of our lives. He knows our joys, our sorrows, our struggles, everything. We are known and loved by the God, the creator of the universe. And God cares for his creation. He tends the earth and feeds its creatures in verses 8 and 9. And there we see the, the cycle of rain. Uh, last month, we saw how important the cycle of rain is because we got none for like six weeks. And it was 100 degrees. And I don't know about y'all, but the only thing that grew in my yard was weeds, which makes no sense to me. How is that possible? But then it started raining. And our grass, I don't know about y'all, my grass shot up. Like hay almost. Rain is a simple and yet profound demonstration of God's provision. Without rain, the earth would be barren. And God prepares rain for the earth. And it, it ensures that life is sustained. And the cycle of water, evaporation, condensation, con condensation, easy for me to say, precipitation, reflects God's intricate design and maintenance of the earth. Because it is able to grow grass. And we don't think about grass often unless it gets too high and then we start to get angry at our child for not mowing it when he's supposed to. No personal insight on that one at all. Uh, but do you ever think about all of the benefits that grass does? Grass cleans the air. It actually has the ability to trap carbon dioxide. It improves the soil, both as it decomposes after we cut it, but also by al allowing better water absor absorption. It reduces erosion. It actually can decrease the temperature. I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, which is both the hottest and the coldest place I've ever lived. And in the middle of the summer, in the middle of July, regularly it would get to 115 degrees because it was a concrete jungle. But they had an area called Forest Park, which is sort of modeled on Central Park of New York City, a little bit smaller. And Forest Park was almost always five to eight degrees cooler than the rest of St. Louis. They say that happens in Central Park as well. It's 
because of all the vegetation and all of those things. But then it also provides food for cattle, which in turn provides food for us. But I think one thing that we could easily kind of look past real quickly is this line here about caring for the young ravens. I mention that because ravens are mentioned in the dietary laws as unclean. Um, we might think of them as insignificant. I mean, when we think of, the ra of ravens, they're not necessarily the prettiest bird. They're not something that we think about often, unless you happen to be a football fan and t like a team in Baltimore. But they're given special mention here. God hears their cries and he provides for them. This reflects his compassion and attention to even the most vulnerable amongst his creation and his creatures. And as God cares for the ravens, how much more does he care for us, his children? This regularity of the natural cycles, rain, growth, sustenance, it's a testimony to God's faithfulness. He provides the grass, he provides the cattle, the ravens, he provides for us all. And verses 15 to 18 goes on and talks about how he commands the weather even. We look at the weather and we marvel at his sovereignty and his majesty, his power and his justice and his love. We look at how all the different seasons. I, I will say, you know, y'all know I'm from South Carolina and Florida. I love warm weather, but there is something neat about the Virginia, the change of seasons. Charles Spurgeon says, it is wise to see God in winter and in distress, as well as in summer and prosperity. But then we move from the creation aspect to also looking at how his control over his people. Verses 2 and 3, he says, he heals the brokenhearted. For the original audience, this would have been so profound because they're just returning from the exile. They're coming back. Uh, they're coming back to their place. And he cares about their brokenness. He, he, he heals the wounded. And his love and his kindness, he rebuilds broken lives. He restores families and he heals bodies. And if you're grieving, the Lord knows. Don't run from him, run to him. Look for healing. If you're crushed in spirit, look to the one who is crushed for you. Isaiah spoke about this when he prophesied in chapter 61, and this is obviously looking forward to Jesus. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. This is all looking to what Jesus is going to do. Because Jesus, as we see just a few chapters earlier, he's going to be the suffering servant. He is familiar with the things we go through, with the wounds that are there. And we need to understand he's there. He's there when we're being crushed in spirit. We certainly have physical wounds which maim us. But we have spiritual and emotional wounds as well. The writer of Proverbs puts, puts it in these words, A man's spirit can endure sickness, but a crushed spirit who can bear? Who can bear? The Lord restores the crushed in spirit. My brothers and sisters, when you are feeling that crushing weight, run to the cross. Run to him. There is no deficiency with him. Psalm 147 goes on to talk about how he, he lifts up the humble and he punishes the wicked. He's there with his people. He's there with the humble in spirit and he lifts them up, but he does not allow injustice to keep going. In Proverbs 20, we learn that he despises dishonest scales. Micah 6, 8 tells us we are to love justice. 
And our longing for justice is ultimately a longing for Jesus at a point where he will make all things right. Because he takes pleasure in his people. The strength and might of nations means nothing to God. He does not care how powerful a country is. He doesn't care about their military. He doesn't care what weapons they possess. He cares about his children. (coughs) And he loves to make the powerful rich and wise of the world to become fools. And he loves to take the weak and despised of this world and to exalt them. Because the Father has perfect delight in his Son. And through our union with Christ, the Father is pleased with us. Because when God looks upon us, those of us who are in the body of believers of Jesus Christ, he doesn't look just at us as we are. He sees us wrapped in his Son's majesty and righteousness. The union with Christ Tim Keller says, this unimaginably immense God has given pleasure, real joy and delight when human beings put their life's hope in his gracious love. And then he concludes this chapter from his book with this prayer. Lord, it is astonishing that I can bring you delight and this delight does not wax or wane depending on my performance, but is unvarying because I am in Jesus Christ. Let me start every day from the platform that only eyes in the universe The only eyes in the universe that count are delighted in me. So what do we do with all of this? Well, one of the main things is we need to know his word. We need to be instructed by his word. We have the great privilege to live on this side of the cross, to know all that God and Christ have accomplished. And we need to share his word. We need to know it. (laughs) I was a little astounded. So when I was teaching at Ligonier, uh, I I was teaching on four different Bible characters, Abraham, Moses, Gideon, and Paul. And I was astounded not only at some of the, the comments about, hey, our kids didn't know this, but some of the adults who were there, some of the volunteers had no idea about some of Moses's ask the life of Moses. No idea that he was a murderer. No idea that Moses was not a young man when he became the leader of Israel, that he was a much older man. Some of them had never heard of Gideon and had barely ever read the book of Judges. And I'm not here to shame that at all, but what I'm saying is we as the body believers have to know what God's word says. John and I love preaching. We would not be up here on a regular basis if we didn't. But we will never be able to make the impact that daily, studious, and meditative scripture reading can do. And you're going to come across passages that you don't understand, and you're like, what is this? And we're more than willing. There are no dumb questions. The only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Please come, let's talk, let's read it through it, let's talk about it. But we've got to know his word because we are called to praise God. We are called to recognize his sovereignty in every aspect of our lives. And we see this when we understand scripture and how much it says to us. And then we need to reflect on his provision for us and give him thanks for all that he's done and rejoice in all of his goodness. We're told in scripture, if we don't shout our praises, then the rocks will. We need to rejoice in personal reflection. We need to pray regularly. If you don't know how to pray, start in Psalm 1 and pray the Psalms right back to God. They cover almost every aspect of human life. We need to rejoice in our prayers. We need to rejoice in the reading and the preaching of God's word. We need to rejoice that the Lord has called men and women to serve his kingdom and this congregation. And as this particular chapter says in the Bible, we need to rejoice with singing and with instruments. Psalm 147 mentions uh, our voices and the lyre, which is basically a guitar. Psalm 150 goes on to expound on this and includes the trumpet, the lute, the harp, the tambourine, strings, a pipe, and cymbals. We should be engaged in good worship using everything that we have to our gifts and talents, abilities, whatever that may be. 
We need to pray and worship and praise. Because in commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. 